All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Mao Lion webinar, the most fun you can have at home without the police bursting down your door. Uh, my name is Aaron. I am the founder of the Mao Lion. Today is the second day after the circuit breaker ended, but since I am afraid of meeting people with different opinions and also girls, I am staying safe and sound indoors. I'm going to introduce our panelists shortly, but first, a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, for those of you who have used Zoom before, you know the drill. The questions tab is for asking questions, like when does the swimsuit round start? The chat tab is for discussions, like how all the panelists look fantastic in swimwear. If you ask questions in the chat, they're liable to get lost. If you hold discussions in the questions tab, you're liable to be kicked out. Uh, we, of course, welcome questions, so please keep sending them in throughout the session. If it's relevant to the, the matter at hand, I'll definitely try and bring it in. If not, we'll see how many we can answer at the end. Uh, we have room tonight in this uh, Zoom, Zoom room tonight for, 100, for, for, for 500 participants. So I'm really looking forward to a, a great discussion. Uh, finally, a recording of uh, tonight's webinar will be made available later on in case I say something really embarrassing on camera and you want to relive the moment again and again. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists in just a second, uh, but first, I think I'm pretty sure now is a tough time for anyone in the Miles game, right? Because with COVID-19, travels become all but impossible. And since very few people hold Miles as, as kind of a, like an end in itself, uh, it's understandable that people are taking second glances at their balances, right? As of today, we still have no idea when the government will lift the travel ban, uh, what countries will be allowed to go to, uh, much less what countries will be going to take us, or even what the in-flight experience will look like. And that really has to change how we approach credit card strategy. And specifically, it changes the evaluation of a mile. It changes your decision process for even buying miles. It changes the cards you use and the willingness to pay annual fees. And finally, it changes how you plan for travel, right? The cabins you're willing to redeem for, the places you're willing to or able to go. So joining me tonight to discuss these questions are uh, Detsatya from uh, Wattcart and Aaron Chan from Multitude. Thank you for joining me, guys. Uh, could I get Detsatya first and then Aaron to say a few words about themselves? Sure. So Aaron, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dexter. I am the co-founder of Wattcart. Wattcart is a website that you can use as a tool to do a search on the merchants that you are intending to transact with, with your credit card. For example, if you are interested to uh, swipe a credit card at McDonald's, you can go to whatcard.sg, type McDonald's in the search engine, and you will be able to determine which of your existing credit cards will be able to get you the, the most credit card rewards. And a secondary function of Wattcard is that we also function as a blog, just like errands, uh, both errands. Yes, it, it's kind of fantastic. What card is, is how I found out that the UOB preferred platinum visa uh, gives you bonus points for certain adult website transactions. So that, that was pretty, pretty eye-opening, um, but we won't get into those details. Uh, thanks, Dexter. Uh, Aaron, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, so um, similar to um, Aaron Wong and Dexter, so I'm from the Multitude. Uh, essentially, it just started off as a hobby. Uh, and to essentially highlight some of the uh, promotions out there that can help you gain more miles from your spending to make every dollar you spend count towards something. And um, I think there is, a, a, based on the agenda, there's quite a number of interesting topics uh, that we're going to discuss tonight. And I'm looking forward to a very fruitful discussion with the panelists as well as all of you this evening. Uh, so um, uh, just enjoy. Great, thank, thank you guys. Uh, we're going to get underway, but before we do that, I need to ask everyone in the audience a very, very important question, because how we approach tonight's discussion all hinges on this. So there should be a poll appearing on your screen right now, and the question is, what is your current valuation of a Mao given all that's going on? Right, and I, I'm sure I don't need to explain why this is important, because if we don't know how much we value a Mao, we won't know how much we're willing to pay for it and we won't know how much we're willing to accept when we redeem it, right? So everything you do in the miles game, whether it's redemptions, whether it's acquiring miles, all depends on this one figure. Do I use my credit card overseas and pay the fee? 
if the merchant says, oh, you want to use your fee, you must, you want to use a credit card, you got to pay me like a 3% fee, do I pay it? Everything comes down to this one particular number. So, interesting, uh, the vast, well, a significant majority of people are still going to know it's the higher end of between 1.8 to 2 cents. That's interesting, but we're going to talk about that in, in a bit. Uh, second, almost joint seconds between 1.4 to 1.6, all right? Uh, interestingly, uh, and not an insignificant amount of people, about 20% are around the 1.2 cents or less figure. I'm going to crunch what the weighted average of this is later on. I'll, I'll be very fascinated. Okay, but it, it, it seems that most people are still falling roughly around 1.6 to 1.8 cents mark. Okay, that's, that's interesting because now we're going to see how, uh, the three, how these three of us approach um, how the three of us approach the mild valuation. So I've written about Mali's valuation extensively. I think the last time I did an update on this was ugh, maybe just over 12 months ago. Uh, and before that, my valuation was just about two cents, which is what I'm sure most people classically value a Mao at. Uh, in that update 12 months ago, I reduced it to 1.8 cents. Uh, the reason being that there were quite a few new ways of buying miles in the market. And more importantly, because that two cents figure hadn't changed for four or five years. And in that time, there were a couple of Singapore Airlines devaluations. So it just didn't make sense that the valuation should mathematically stay the same. Uh, given all that's happening right now, I tend to fall around the 1.5 cents per mile range. And um, let me emphasize again uh, to Evan this thing. This is not scientific by any means. There's no formula behind it. I've not crunched numbers. This is basically me asking myself, if I could buy as many miles as I wanted, what is the maximum price I would be going to pay based on the alternatives available in the market and based on what I can spend it on? Uh, the reason for my, my downgrade of that is uh, twofold. Number one uh, is that we've seen even more ways of getting miles cheaper in the market. So I don't know how many of you remember, but at the start of this year, Citibank Premier Miles customers, there was this promotion where if you hit a certain amount of spending, you can buy additional miles. Uh, the price was about 0 0.97 cents each, right? And City Premier Miles Visa is an entry level card, right? This is a $30,000 income requirement card. So it's not like, say, your uh, OCBC uh, voyage where you need to earn 120000 and then you can buy all the miles you want at 1.9 cents. This is a very low price, and it's very accessible to uh, most people who are able to meet that spending threshold in order to allow you to pay the admin fee to buy some additional miles. I think quite a few people in the Telegram group did get on board with that. I can't remember whether the miles have been credited yet, but that's really quite, quite a low price. Uh, two other developments we saw, uh, Rent Hero, for those of you who are paying rent right now, they cut their admin fee to 1.75% in March, which means that you can buy miles from like 1.07 cents each, really, really cheap. Uh, Cardup right now is doing the 1.75% income tax fee, so that's also buying miles on around 1.07 cents. And we're even seeing some other promotions for things like pay all and all. Um, there is a targeted pay all promotional email going around offering people the chance to buy uh, miles at, sorry, offering people a, a $1 admin fee. I really need to figure out how, how that works. Uh, it is kind of targeted though. So because of that, I've kind of downgraded to about 1.5. And I think the other thing that I'd also keep in mind really is um, when you do go and fly, the premium cabin experience is going to be not as fantastic as before. I don't know how many of you have read uh, things on Executive Traveler and other places about like Emirates is cutting back, right? That luxurious first class experience isn't going to be so grand for the foreseeable future. Uh, Turkish Airlines, known for their famous meal service, they are just going to give out uh, cold meal boxes now, like pre-packed boxes. So I, I think some of the shine will go off travel for the, for the near future at least. And that's also another reason contributing to my, to my downgrade. Um, now, we're going to hear a few other opinions. I think the other one's really interesting here is Dexter, right? Because Dexter, wait for it, is not clicking properly. Now clicking properly. 1.1 1 .1 cents per mile. Like, come on, really? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm happy to to discuss how uh, you know as a as a as a team we came to this uh, decision. So um, we really triangulated from all the recent developments in in the airline industry. So um, here are some statistics of what has happened. You know, uh, after the COVID outbreak in in well, in January. So what we see is globally, the air travel has, has declined um, in the month of March and April. It has declined by about 50 to 90%. And uh, as a result, this collapse in demand really is, is it results in people not being able to uh, travel. Flights are cancelled. And uh, a lot of people, for example, like uh, another co-founder, Glenn, he originally had a trip to New Zealand planned all booked and ready, but you know, this trip obviously uh, not achievable. I, I mean, it's not feasible for him to go to New Zealand in April. So he had to postpone his trip. So what we, we came to this decision really from seeing that there is an oversupply of miles in the market today, right? It, it is not from the perspective of what uh, it, it costs to acquire miles, but it is more from if you are an existing person with uh, miles as an, as an asset, what are you going to do with it today? What can you do with it today? So uh, obviously your first use case, which is to travel, that's uh, out of the window for the foreseeable future. Um, your second use case as a user is maybe uh, redeeming it for hotels to stay locally at a staycation. And if you just take a look at, uh, I think Chris Fly has a V-Room program. If you take a look there, you will see that, yes, if you exchange your, I don't know, 30, 40,000 miles, you do, uh, you will be able to get a, a, a night at, at a very fancy four-star hotel or five-star hotel. But right next to that, you will see an, uh, a, an alternative exchange rate, which is uh, it's quoted in US dollars. But basically how it works out is actually that you can redeem the room. Um, if you redeem it all in miles and then you just compare the equivalent dollar value, it will be valued at less than uh, one cent per month. So we tri triangulated from that, uh, what, using that as one example. Another example where we got this, uh, I guess the basis of our valuation is really uh, some headlines in the airline industry. Uh, we saw that there was a Star Alliance member, which is Air Canada, uh, that recently announced in the month of May that they were selling miles, right? They were, they were raising cash so that uh, they can stay afloat. And they were selling miles to their existing uh, uh, customers at a price of about one cent per dollar, right? So that's okay. really how we, 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 I guess, get anchored to uh, this, this valuation of around one cent per, uh, uh, sorry, one cent per mile. And, yeah. and what we, uh, I guess, what we have seen is that there's a little bit of disconnect in the market. So we, when we thought that our hypothesis is that it's one cent per mile, then um, what we saw in, for example, if we try to buy a mile on carousel, people are, are still selling it at you know, 1.7 cents or to, to two or to 1.9 cents, right? So uh, our opinion is that uh, there's some way to go uh, if, if it goes to the fair value. But the silver lining in all this is really that if you are not forced to sell, if you, do, you haven't lost your job, if you, your mouse still have some way that you can push back the expiry, yeah, we believe that it, you know, Aaron, Aaron Wong, what you say is, is reasonable. It might come back to 1.5. It's just that uh, you need to have some cash tied over this period of time then, and you are a forced seller, then, then the fair value today will be 1.5. Well, yeah, yeah, sorry, but let me just, just interrupt you there. It's kind of interesting you brought up the example of Chris Lyre Brooms, right? Because the thing with Chris Lyre Brooms is it was always an option even before COVID. I think they introduced it in 2017, and please someone inside the chat, just fact check me if I'm wrong. I think it was 2017, right? And yeah, that, that's been the uh, one, roughly one, one cent-ish uh, valuation, but that was always the case even before uh, COVID, right? So it's it's not that so it's, it's, it's not so much that the valuation has come down in that sense. It's, it's, it's more like because you can't fly, if yeah. you wanted to cash out your miles now, this is your option. But yeah. to use a very, very bad analogy, if, if you think about this, like the stock market, right? And you think about your miles and stocks, just because the market is down now, 
I mean, it's a paper loss until you're willing to cash them out. So yes, yep. if you did cash them out now, you'd take some pretty bad value because flights simply aren't available unless you are able to redeem for like one, one year in advance. Uh, but, and, and, and until that point, right, there, there's no real reason why you should exit now, right? Because, I mean, you are alluding to the idea of selling your mouse, but that's not, I mean, that, that's not an option for most law-abiding people. <laughs> As you know, it's, it's, it's against the terms and conditions, so you, you can't really liquidate that way. Uh, and because you can't really liquidate that way, is it then fair to say, look, on Carousel, they're, they're doing like 1.7, 1.8, uh, and we're, we're going to take that, that, that valuation. That doesn't add up from my point of view. Yeah, I guess um, what we, like, our, our basis is that the value of it today is the use case of the mouth today, right? So if you, I mean, you still can redeem uh, flights with a mouth. It's, it's not impossible. Uh, we just checked that, um, for example, if we try to look for a flight to Tokyo in the month of July, yeah, you still can get it uh, at uh, a rate of about 60,000 miles, I believe. And this is, um, while the prices have come down a little bit, uh, average about 10%. Uh, so, you know, if previously your fair value of a mile was 2, two cents, then based on the price decline and uh, a fixed exchange rate, then you might say that, yeah, the value of the mile might have dropped about 10% because you can redeem a flight for it. Uh, we think that this, uh, it, it, it comes more from a perspective of, uh, you know, even if there are flights, you probably will not use it and uh, what do you do with it, right? So uh, what I, I guess where we're coming from is that the best use of, uh, alternative use of miles today is, is probably like a staycation or redeeming it for uh, something in, in uh, some kind of um, discount or, or service. That's, that's, those are the main use cases of miles today. And Sorry, let me just bring in Aaron here because uh, we've not heard from him yet. So he, he's higher than me, right? He's much closer to the classic 1.8 to 2 cents range. So uh, Aaron, how, how are you approaching this? I mean, how, what, what, what would you say to Dexter who is almost half of your valuation? Okay, so for myself, um, essentially I, 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 I like to see myself as the most optimistic among the three of us. Uh, actually, my valuation was uh, in the bracket of 1.8 to 2, but it's now just below 1.8. Uh, so why I say this is, first of all, I would like to echo what Aaron said earlier about this valuation of a mouse being a very subjective exercise. Um, and that it really depends on how you acquire the mouse and how you intend to use them. All right. So uh, firstly, why I think that it's only depressed ever so slightly is because we may see um, FS4 uh, uh, post-COVID-19 when travel starts to pick up. Uh, in an attempt to lure passengers back. So as a result, this may reduce the value of your mouse uh, ever so slightly. But however, um, this may be offset by uh, the fact that uh, some routes will see very limited flight options to begin with, which means that um, there will, might be very little competition to drive the FS down significantly to depress the value of the mouse. All right. Um, secondly, I can see that um, as a, from a perspective of supply and demand, yes, there might be a lot of miles floating out there in the market waiting for, uh, for, uh, to be redeemed uh, for flights post-COVID-19. Um, but this may be um, slightly offset by a perceived lack of confidence in the travel industry's ability to ensure safe passage of passengers uh, traveling again. So even though you may be sitting on lots of miles, um, I'm not very sure, even Ayata uh, seems to think that uh, travel may not recover to pre-COVID-19 levels in, uh, within a year. Maybe we might, even, we might have to wait two years before we can see it rise back to pre-COVID-19 levels. Um, yeah. Another point is that um, um, uh, the other panelists have alluded to uh, acquiring miles at a very low uh, or discounted rate. Uh, but we can, we can also see other uh, frequent flyer programs like Alaska Mileage Plan or A Advantage, you know. Um, they, uh, they do have better sales in recent months, uh, but um, it's only um, slightly better than what we've seen so far. So it doesn't warrant a significant devaluation of the, the mile, in my opinion. And finally, one point I'd like to raise is, um, I think Aaron alluded to this point as well, about, uh, about the service that we're going to expect uh, post-COVID, I think um, for perhaps up to a year after uh, travel restrictions are lifted, we might not get the same level of service we are used to seeing uh, in the premium cabins. 
Okay, mm. so uh, to me, I would see it as a soft evaluation, but it really depends on a very subjective um, um, assessment or a subjective valuation of that service. So um, um, I, I, I think I can live with uh, a simpler service uh, on board in business or first, uh, but at least I get to enjoy the hard product. And uh, that being said, uh, I, I would like to also say that um, a, a significant devaluation of the Mao would only occur if, there, if we see hard devaluations, as I would like to call it, uh, in, in, as you see in the award charts. So, SQ already devalued a couple of times in the past few years. So uh, in an attempt to lure passengers back to travel, uh, I don't foresee uh, airlines um, uh, devaluating their award charts significantly in the near future. So that's, in a nutshell, that's uh, why I think that uh, the valuation of the mouse only ever depressed so slightly to the bracket of 1.7, 1.8. Yeah, that's my take on it. And that, that's kind of interesting, right? Because we, we're going to maybe do a uh, touch a little bit on, on potential devaluations later on. Uh, a, a couple of weeks back, I had, uh, I had Nick Lemming and uh, Mark Millenew in here. Uh, they're both experts in the loyalty field. Their, their general sense was that we probably won't see devaluations, at least for Singapore Airlines, uh, number one, because they've already done their devaluation pretty recently. And number two, because if anything, the opportunity cost of seats now are going to be very low, at least for the next six to 12 months. I mean, people aren't really flying, right? We, we've, we've all seen those pictures of, of like 95% empty planes, mostly ferrying cargo and just the odd few passengers to be repatriated. Uh, and it's for exactly for that reason that because the opportunity cost of the, of the empty seat is, isn't so high right now, there's, there's no real pressure to devalue. Uh, it's, it's not even like Singapore Airlines needs to, needs to show up the balance sheet to raise additional capital because we know they've typically got that funding from uh, the market pretty, pretty recently. Um, so one, one interesting, so, so, so Ivan's brought up this, this question here. He's saying, shouldn't the valuation of a mile be based on what you can get from them? All right, and he's quoting the example of 180,000 miles, uh, Singapore Airlines, uh, business class Paris. Um, and if it's 1.5 cents per mile, it's about 2.2.8K for the ticket. Uh, is business class still worth this much? Uh, short answer is actually worth more. <laughs> the funny thing is that if you go on the Singapore Airlines website right now and you pull up the uh, fares to Paris, I'm pretty sure business class will still be four, five thousand. Uh, someone please check and let me know. Uh, but see, see, I mean, that, that's like one way of valuing miles is to look at how much you get if you were to um, buy the ticket. But of course, there is a, a logical fallacy in that because you can only value the miles at that threshold uh, if you were going to buy the ticket anyway, right? So theoretically speaking, right, I could redeem uh, 200 plus 230,000 miles, right, for Singapore Airlines first class between Singapore and Paris. And that ticket may cost like eight, nine thousand dollars But for me to say that I got four, five cents per mile implies that I would have been willing to pay eight, nine thousand dollars for the ticket in the first place, right? So unless you're really rolling in the dough, that doesn't really apply. And therefore, this at most, this, this um, cost of the cash ticket is more indicative rather than deterministic. It's not a simple math equation where you take value of ticket uh, divided by number of miles, that's roughly your cents per mile. Yeah, and I want to show this uh, table here. So I think this is also kind of helpful. Uh, what I've composed here, right, is that the range of ways that you can buy miles right now in Singapore to different um, avenues. So I mentioned rent here, I mentioned card up, but you know, know that there's, there's also pay all, this SC easy bill, even ASS is getting in on the show right now, right? They've got this ASS pay and earn. And even though the admin fee is a bit higher at 2.5%, uh, it does let you earn um, miles on certain transactions that you normally can't. And of course you've got uh, voyage pay and privy pay, which is basically buy as many miles as you want, no questions asked, but it's a bit of a higher price. So here's the question I want to put forward to you guys, right? Given this pricing now uh, and the valuation that you've mentioned, uh, because keep in mind there's, there's two kinds of valuation, right? There's the price that you buy and the price that you, the, the, the value that you accept when you redeem. Uh, what would be a buy price for you guys in terms of uh, buying miles through the bank? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the airlines in, in a bit, but just from the bank's price, at what price are you guys a buyer? <laughs> to be honest, uh, for myself, I I would probably buy at a at, at the, the value that I, I mentioned earlier. I think that that 
uh, if I'm acquiring mouse, I think that uh, price is a fair price to pay. Um, because if it's, uh, if it's a number that is like, I don't know, 1.5 cents per mile, I, I will, I, I think it's a, it's a free market, right? Like I will just choose the most competitive uh, option out there and I will, and everybody will gravitate towards it because so, so therefore like even like there are so many vendors, I would, I would choose the one that makes sense, but uh, I would also, I guess, um, try to maybe hedge my strategy a little bit and have some in uh, maybe one or two other, other um, vendors just in case uh, they, that particular uh, partner uh, tries to, to uh, play punk, change the exchange rate, uh, then at least I still have a backup. Bank of China. <laughs> uh, Aaron, how, how about you? What, what price would you be a buyer? Yeah, I would say um, anywhere in the bracket of um, uh, 1.5 to, to 1.8, I'm still willing, I'm still, I'm still happy with it because uh, uh, it really depends on, on, on your access to getting the miles uh, at the price that you want. So uh, this is a very subjective practice and, uh, and a very subjective exercise. Uh, so I would place my, uh, my ballpark figure as, as, as what I mentioned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then there's also the other issue, right? So as Dexter mentioned, we saw Air Canada Aeroplan hold this massive uh, sale uh, where, where miles were like 1 to 1.3 uh, uh, cents each. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, not as fantastic. I know Alaska Airlines, uh, it, some lucky people were targeted for like a 60% bonus, which is kind of unheard of. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that the vast majority of the other hotel programs, they aren't doing anything really special right now. I mean, I think you think this is a time where they have to double down on the sales. But the most recent Hilton, most recent IHG sales have been 100% bonuses, which we're seeing consistently for the past couple of years. No big changes there. Uh, Life Miles hasn't done a sale recently, but <laughs> given what's happening to Avianca, I doubt a lot of people will be buyers. Uh, Hyde as well, which is kind of a shame because Hyde points do uh, retain value pretty well. So um, are, are either of you in the market to buy miles and points from hotels or airlines at this point in time? I, I am not. <laughs> uh, I have an existing uh, uh, inventory of miles and I think uh, even though I might get some good discount now, when they launch promotions, I, I, I rather take a conservative approach and clear my stock first. And just out of curiosity, how, how, how much of a stock are, are we talking about? Because that also affects the thing, right? Obviously, if you're only at 50,000, you're more inclined to buy than if you're like on 5 million, right? Yeah, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have that much. So uh, for me, I have uh, about uh, 40,000 miles. So uh, that's uh, probably enough for me to go on a short haul flight. And uh, yeah, so for me, um, I probably this year, given that you know the out outlook so uncertain, I just use it for to to do a, maybe a staycation instead. Got it. Yeah, sorry, Aaron. Yeah, so for myself, uh, I'm not inclined um, uh, to purchase miles in bulk um, because I always advocate that do not purchase miles speculatively. I also have a stash of miles with Chris Flyer and Alaska Mileage Plan. So, um, um, but really, you do not know what's going to happen to, uh, to airlines, you know, um, in, in the news, we've seen that uh, airlines are struggling and we've seen some airlines uh, restrict uh, uh, their members from redeeming their miles on other metal. Like I think Thai Airways, Thai Airways just recently announced that. So, so I, I think we shouldn't uh, purchase miles speculatively, especially in bulk, even though it is a really good deal, unless, you know, we are very sure that travel restrictions are being lifted in the near future and you have an absolute immediate use for it. Uh, yeah, so I, I wouldn't advocate uh, purchasing miles uh, at this point in time. So Melvin saw this interesting point. You're saying, isn't acquiring miles now also acquiring airline risk? How do we know if the airline will still be around? Uh, well, the thing is, Melvin, anytime you buy miles, I mean, not just now, right? You are acquiring airline risk because you're basically giving up your real money for the airline or hotel's funny money with the hope that you'll still be around where you redeem. And I get the point that the risk now may be higher than what it normally is, given the situation. Uh, the way I see it though, it really depends on the program that you're buying for from. So right now, I probably wouldn't be a buyer for like Life Miles, even if they went on sale. Uh, but others like Alaska, for example, I'm not overly concerned. I mean, they, they are a... Uh, uh, 
company that issues uh, debt. So they do have uh, ratings reports by Fitch and, and Moody's and the like, and uh, apparently their cash flow position is still pretty solid. Um, as with all things, I mean, if I were disinclined to buy miles in a program before COVID, like obviously that still maintains, but I can't really think of any program for which I would have been a buyer before COVID that I'm suddenly not now with the possible exception of our life miles. I mean, to, to put things another way, right? If, um, if, if, if Hilton points go on sale and the rate is uh, better than usual 100%, I would pretty, I'm pretty certain I would buy as well because I don't see, Hil I don't see any risk for the Hilton Marriott type chains. Famous last words, but it's not, it's, to me, it's kind of fundamentally different from buying from like a really small carrier. I know, I know people were buying miles from Tap Portugal a few uh, weeks before, just so for some fantastic bonus. I, I probably won't dabble in that, uh, but I, I you know, it, it's not that big, not that pressing a concern, at least for, for, for right now. Um, Okay, now let's just talk card strategy because I think we, we could do a lot of stuff on our card strategy. And I think one of the questions here might be relevant uh, as well. So given all that's, that's going on right now, right, what we know um, about uh, what we can do with mouse, what we can't do with mouse more specifically, uh, what are we doing, right? I'm still keeping the faith, right? I'm still holding on to the mouse strategy, right? Which is for now, all my general spending is either one of these two. So grab pay card, I'm pretty sure everyone here listening already knows it, so we don't need to obfuscate terms. But yes, if you have the City Rewards Visa, like most people would still have, uh, you do effectively get four miles per dollar everywhere for um, the first thousand every month. Uh, everything else is going on the AMX Platinum Charge uh, because number one, they're doing the double points promotion until 20th July, uh, which is fantastic because it's like 1.56 miles per dollar. Uh, and of course, AMEX points, as you know, are pretty valuable because they do have eight, nine different transfer partners. Uh, everything else for me, uh, most of our spending now is pretty much online. So that's where you bring in the City Rewards Visa, right, for your first thousand. And of course, the DBS Women's Card. City Rewards Visa right now, I'm pretty sure some of you know, right, they're, they're doing that fantastic promotion, uh, which is uh, eight miles per dollar on the first, was it 1,000 <coughs> on Lazada and... <coughs> quite a few other merchants. So that's pretty good for me. And I think among these four cards, I'm pretty much set because this is really covering all that I have, right? If I'm shopping online, uh, the two at the bottom, if I'm heading out for whatever reason, the two on the top. Uh, Aaron, what's yours? Pretty similar. Yeah, so uh, for my case, it's exactly uh, the same four cards uh, as what uh, Aaron previously mentioned. Uh, I would like to add that uh, 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 maybe due to limited space on the slide, I, and I, I forgot to mention earlier, but uh, the UOB uh, pre uh, preferred platinum visa still uh, is still in my wallet. I mean, if if I do uh, do take away and they accept, um, okay, obviously the card has to be saved in your mobile wallet. Please remember to do that. Uh, yes, then I can still get four miles per dollar uh, using the UOB PTV card. Yeah, other than that, it's pretty much similar to what Aaron has uh, mentioned. Yeah. And. Uh Adam's asking that the valuation is 1.1 cents. Why aren't you going for cash back? Well, dum dum dum. Here it is. So, yeah, so what's what's your strategy right now? I think that's just frozen. See, I, I told you cash back is really really bad because it just makes people freeze up in fear. Uh, I'm assuming everyone else is hearing me, right? It's it's not just me, right? That's the dropped off, right? Everyone else hears me. See. Cashback is really, really bad, everyone. Look, look at what it does to people. That's the, are, are you with us? No. Look. <laughs> I'm not even kidding right now. Okay, we'll, we'll try and get that stuff back. But just remember that he, he's advocating DBS Live Fresh. So I'm assuming that's for his online spending. Uh, and then he's got the Maybank uh, Visa, uh, Horizon, Horizon Visa Signature. I think that's for, for transportation and, 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 and dining. Uh, and then there's interestingly YouTube as well. I, I'm not sure what that's going for right now uh, with YouTube uh, because you can't really travel, but I'm sure once that comes back in, he'll be able to handle that. Uh, okay, so let's, let's hope and pray we can get that back. Uh, let me pick up this one first. 
Yeah, so someone's asking why, why grab pay card? I mean, this is, this is a pretty simple question. So grab pay card is basically that if you have the city rewards visa, that you can still earn four miles per dollar on grab pay top ups for the first $1,000 every month. So grab pay card, as you know, can be used pretty much anywhere. So it's like earning four miles per dollar anywhere. And we have Mr. Cashback now. Sorry, sir. So yes, what's, what's your point? I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what happened. I think the <laughs> Sorry, Jetson. Yeah, go, go ahead. Wow. Uh, 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 wow. Okay. Sorry, so that's so your line's still kind of bad, uh, and it's 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 really choppy. So, uh, could you try um, rejoining, and then we'll try and try and bring, bring you back. All right. Okay, I will do that. No, sorry, sorry. Good, 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 good. Yeah. I'll do that. No, no, good. Wow. Yeah, see, see, cashback ruins everything. I told you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, just in, in terms of, of card strategy. Uh, so, 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 someone's asking me about um, expiry of points, right? So the question is, if I'm using DBS altitude points have no expiry, uh, should I be worried about current valuation? Is there any downside of keeping points? Yeah, so here's the thing, right? That, that, that's, that some people will think that you know it's it's good to earn points with no expiry, uh, because I can hold on to them indefinitely. That is right and wrong. It's good because there's no pressure on you to redeem before it's time. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not a license to hold it indefinitely. I mean, gone are the days when someone earns miles for retirement, right? So it's it's good that the miles don't expire, uh, but it's it doesn't mean that you hold on to them forever. It just means that you've got more time to plan out whatever you want to do. Uh, Aaron, what's what's your thought on the expiry non expiry issue? Yeah, I I, I, uh, I completely agree. I mean, if the uh, if you can leave in your credit card balance, uh, your credit card account balance uh, as much as possible, your points, that'll be great because the moment you switch it to, for example, Chris Flyer, your three years uh, uh, time, uh, I mean, three years uh, expiry will basically start ticking. Uh, but then again, you never know what what may happen. Like as we've seen with the uh, BOC Elite Mouse. Card, you know, they actually devalue the miles that you have earned previously uh, before 15th of June, not, not post 15th June. So, so um, uh, really, the credit card companies can do anything they want with the points. Uh, technically, the points uh, do not uh, really uh, belong to you. You're part of their program, right? So, uh, uh, so it really depends on, 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 on uh, how, much, how much miles, how many miles you accumulate uh, per unit time and how often you cash them out. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you can keep it in, uh, by all means, do it. Otherwise, um, it will start. Your three years expiry will start ticking. Yeah. Let's uh, let's try one more time. Okay. Wow. No. Uh, not not happening. Um, maybe I want to try drawing from a different device. Because it's just not 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 workable right now. Yeah, I, I, actually, sorry, I'm testing a question up here. Ben, ben Benjamin's got that a great point, right? You realize we're so eager to rush into talking about what we're gonna do, we forgot to talk a bit about context about um, how normal patterns are. Because it, it is a very good point that Benjamin's raised. Uh, depending on your uh, preferences for travel, obviously your valuation and your strategy is going to be a bit different. Right, like obviously someone who only flies in economy class everywhere is going to have a pretty low valuation. So uh, I'll, I'll start first. Uh, at least for me, um, never I've never redeemed economy, uh, except in some extreme cases. Right? Uh, my typical travel will be maybe at least six to seven hours for redemptions. Uh, and I would say doing about, well, before COVID hit, right? I would do maybe eight to nine flights a year. Um, not all of them vacations. Some of them are kind of like working trips. Um, destinations, um, six to seven hours at least will put you around Japan, um, Middle East, uh, Australia, and of course, US and uh, Europe as well. Um, and that's probably why my, my valuation tends to fall a bit on the higher side, but probably not as much as uh, Aaron's. Sorry, Aaron, what's, what's your travel pattern? Yeah, so uh, for myself, similarly, I don't uh, redeem for economy and um, I go um, for my redemption flights, it's always in business and first. Travel-wise, um, I tend to use the um, the stopover trick quite a lot, quite often. So you can 
So it actually determines my uh, the choice of destination. For example, uh, I tend to do a lot from Australia to US via Singapore or to Europe via Singapore. Um, so that, 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 that those really fall under medium to long haul flights. Um, and uh, I tend to travel, uh, but maybe once every couple of months or every quarter. So that'll put me about uh, five to six trips a year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, uh, since, since Dexter is temporarily in, incapacitated, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate because we, we've got someone here who thinks we're being a bit unfair to our cash back. So uh, point is, right, he's saying City Prestige, I was fine this month. I don't see why I should keep it. Why not switch to cash back until things get better? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, it really depends what your outlook on the situation is going to be. Uh, I have to believe that within the next 12 months, leisure travel will become possible. I just can't see it remaining off the cards for so long. I know we're going to start with essential travel, like obviously with the travel, travel bubbles, green, green lanes, or whatever you, you want to call it. But I personally can't see zero leisure travel for, for, for 12 months. It, the, the math doesn't work out for me. Right? There's, there's too much at stake for some of our neighboring economies not to have tourism. Uh, and similarly, I don't think it's also, uh, I, I, to, to, to the extent that we're able to, to, to the extent that other governments are able to flatten their own curves, uh, I, don't, I don't really see uh, restrictions on leisure travel hanging around for so long. Um, so is cashback an option? Yes, it is. Uh, but keep in mind, I mean, for, for cashback, what's, what's, what's the best possible cashback that you, you could be doing now? Like 1.5, 1.6% unlimited, right? Uh, yes, if you're using specialized cashback cards, you could potentially do, uh, I mean, what's, what's, what's the best cashback rate now? Like 8% on a city, city unlimited, uh, city cashback card, right? But those still have caps and minimum spends as well. So um, depending on how much you're spending as well, cashback may not even be on, on your radar because unless you hit that minimum spend, it's simply not going to be great value. Uh, that's there, cashback, one more time. <laughs> okay, I hope that I'll still be on the line. Yes, uh, yeah, so I was sharing earlier that my uh, credit card strat optimization strategy has actually changed in the last few months. So previously, my strategy was getting the UOB One card, and that was, that was a great time when they had that partnership with Grab. So I would use the UOB One card, hit that minimum uh, $500 per month spending, and uh, every kind of incremental spending above that, I would just sweep it to the general cashback cards like uh, you know, the current CD Cashback Plus, or Stanchart Unlimited, or Amex uh, True Cashback. So uh, I did that because my general spending is, I guess, in that ballpark of uh, five six hundred dollars per month. Mm. And um, recently, uh, obviously, the strategy of UOB One Card uh, double dipping with Grab is no longer viable as of March. So uh, I changed my strategy to uh, the DBS Live Fresh Card. Um, the main reason why I did that is that I am trying to get a cashback without uh, having to meet uh, that kind of uh, three consecutive month commitment. So that's why I chose the DBS Live Fresh card. I like it a lot. It's a 5% cashback across the three categories. Um, just that, you know, with the COVID-19 situation, I don't actually touch the other two categories. I just do the online transaction category. And that leaves me with a, you know, Without any promotion, it leaves me with a $20 cashback on uh, $400 eligible online spending, right? And uh, the issue with the DBS Live Fresh is that you need to clock a minimum of $600 uh, monthly spending. So, you know, like if I just spend the bare minimum, touch $600 and channel it all to online, I would have only gotten uh, like an equivalent of about 3.33% cashback, $20 out of that $600. Uh, not exactly very exciting, but at least that would be something on par with the UOB One card. Um, I would say I'm using the DBS Live Fresh card now because I recently found out that they have this uh, promotion for online transactions. So at DBS is really very opportunist here, right? They launch a 5% additional cashback for online transactions. And that really helped me make the card more appealing compared to the UOB One card. Uh, because now I could get uh, that $40 cashback from $400 of online uh, spending, right? And then I just need to, uh, you know, pay utilities or, or just make up the numbers to a uh, to, uh, $1,000. So the, the condition of getting this additional 
$20 cashback is you need to hit the $1,000 of spending, right, for your card. That means that you get $40 uh, out of 1000 which is 4% cashback. Not too bad, right? It's not 5%, but it's, it's uh, because the 5% is not really feasible unless you can clock all the, the two other categories, right. which is uh, contactless and all other spending, right? So for me, I get 4% spending $1,000 uh, online. That's good enough for me. I use it as a general spend card uh, in these couple of months. And I also like to share about how I use the two other specialized spend card. So for the Maybank Horizon Visa card, this is a card that gives 3.2 miles per dollar. Um, not exactly very useful because it generally gives it only for the dining category, which during circuit breaker, you can't really use, you can't dine anywhere, right? You have to just order takeout. But the other interesting thing about the Maybank Horizon Visa card is that you actually get uh, 3.2 miles per dollar and, and it is only is I think the only card that you can use with uh, grab pay at the moment right you still can get 3.2 topping up your grab pay and uh, after you can top it up you can follow what Aaron Wong does which is use the grab pay as a generic spending card so then that way your generic expenses will be 3.2 miles per dollar so double dipping in a sense one of the last survivors of uh, the purge in the last couple of months and how does U-Trip come in? It's an interesting choice, right? You, you yeah. Can't really... yeah. Uh, so U-Trip is really, um, so I find myself over this period of time taking a, some online courses like on Coursera, and these are denominated in US dollar, right? So U-Trip comes in because uh, you could use it as a card that gives a favorable exchange rate. And just over the month of May, they had actually run a very interesting cashback promotion. So if you had clocked, uh, like $30, uh, Singapore, 30 Singapore dollars equivalent of spending on your U-Trip card, they actually give you a 2% cashback. And, from, and this is uh, true from uh, spending from $30 to $300. So from $300 to $400, you get a 3% cashback, right? Uh, all you need to do is you need to register for the promotion on their website. And when you have a card, you can just get that cashback. Uh, I thought U-Trip is interesting because they give cashback, they give a competitive exchange rate, and there is a new um, double dip theory that I am, uh, I haven't proven yet, I, I'm testing it out, which is using the Citibank Cashback Plus card to top up U-Trip, right? So um, if that works, then you will get 1.6% there uh, as, a, as a cashback. And then from U-Trip, if let's say you, you, they have another promotion in the month of June, giving 2% cashback, you get another 2% or 3%, right? So total, you get maybe up to 4.6%. If you spend $400 and you will get a favorable exchange rate. This is a good strategy if you intend to make uh, online purchases or, or something denominated in uh, foreign currency. Yeah. So look, I mean, I, I understand. I, I'm seeing a few other people asking about the switch to cashback. I think my overall sense on that is, is this, right? Um, if none of the miles cards, miles and points cards for running promotions now, maybe I might be tempted. But the fact of the matter is we've actually seen some pretty amazing promotions on points cards over the past couple of weeks, past couple of months. Like OCBC Titanium Rewards, uh, eight miles per dollar on Food Panda, on, on, uh, on, on Deliveroo, on Lazada. Yes, it was only $500, but that's, that's like one example, right? There was the City Rewards one, which I mentioned earlier, right? That one's eight miles per dollar uh, on, 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 on certain online spending. Uh, we've also seen uh, promotions in terms of uh, help help me out. So there's been City Rewards, there's been OCBC Titanium Rewards. Um, we've seen some spend and redeem promotions as well. I mean, those, those are all for, for DBS cards. I guess you could equally use a cashback card as well. Uh, but the fact of the, of the matter is, I don't really think the banks have stood still on the points cards either because we have seen some pretty good promotions. So for me, the, the question isn't so much, uh, is, is cashback more attractive now because you can't really use your mouse. I mean, I always see it as I'm storing up for something, right? Um, I can't use them now, but like I said, I do think that travel will be on the horizon in its 12 months. Um, Aaron, what's, what's, what's your view on the cashback thing? I mean, how, how, how do you, how, what, 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 what will make you switch to cashback? With that? Um, uh, personally, I, I, I don't, uh, like 0% of my card portfolio is cashback. So I'm really 100% miles. <laughs> Um, because you correctly mentioned that even in this difficult time, uh, credit card companies are rolling up promotions after promotions. Uh, you have rightfully listed a few of them. Um, so 
uh, in my opinion, I think uh, I can still, and especially if I, I find a uh, use for, for, for redemptions in the future, uh, when trouble picks up again, I think um, I'm still sticking to my, um, uh, to my model scheme uh, more than anything else. Uh, yeah, perhaps, um, uh, perhaps Dexter can, can have a take on, on this again. Yeah, um, uh, you, I mean, like the, the question was what would make me, I mean, would make Aaron consider cashback, right? I, I, to be honest, I am generally a cashback person. My, in my portfolio of cards, I, I, I have uh, just this Maybank Horizon Visa card and uh, the City Premier Mouse card. Oh, and the DBS Women's World card. So not too many and then I guess quite specialized use, but I, I uh, to me, you know, given I already shared our outlook on uh, the valuation of our mouse, it's just less attractive at this point uh, to to uh, really uh, accumulate this. And therefore, yeah, I think for the foreseeable future, we'll probably go with a cashback strategy unless there's a, another great mouse card that will help to maybe give make a triple dipping opportunity available. Yeah, then that will be something that we'll consider. Yeah, yeah, and look, I mean, if it, it, there's one thing that I've learned from doing this is that the best reward is one that makes you happy. Uh, I actually do know for a fact that at least a couple of banks were planning to launch new miles cards this year. Uh, they, they, they were in touch about it, but those plans have been pushed back for understandable reasons. Uh, but I think those, I mean, those, those plans haven't been completely um, cancelled. So we are going to see some new launches uh, next 12 months or so uh, that might make the proposition a lot more attractive. Uh, this slide here is kind of like more of an information slide. I don't really think there's too much to discuss here. The, the point I'm trying to make is that if you are going to earn uh, points, make sure they are transferable currencies. Uh, what I mean by transferable currencies are, are, are points that can be credited to multiple frequent flyer programs uh, because you don't want to disproportionately expose yourself to one program. Uh, for example, if, if, your, if your bank only has uh, two airlines and both of them devalue, right, then you're kind of out of luck. But if it's not eight airlines, if two of them devalue, you still have six more to choose from. So I kind of think it's like a way of hedging. And to that end, I recommend Citibank, Standard Chartered, and American Express. They have the most partners. Um, of course, there's also a question of sweet spots, which is probably a totally separate discussion. It will also be interesting to have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when I'm using, I'm using my City Rewards Visa card a lot now, not just because of the promotions, but also because I see it as a hedge, right? When I spend on my City Rewards card, I am getting uh, points that are extremely transferable, uh, and that is very useful for me. So I'm seeing a few questions on premium cards as well. So this is something I want to have a chat with Aaron about. Right? So uh, banks have not covered themselves in glory when it comes to premium cards, right? Because uh, the vast majority of them aren't really doing a whole lot. I mean, American Express is a very obvious exception. So for those of you who are not aware, American Express annual fee, uh, as Eddie points out in, in the questions, is $1,700. Uh, but they've been doing a few things for cardholders. So they have uh, the double miles promotion that we transmitted by. They're also giving you double the value when you redeem points for miles. That's, when you redeem points for, for cash rebates, that, that's normally a uh, pretty bad value, but now, now it's kind of decent. Uh, and most recently, they had a $500 statement credit on uh, supermarket shopping and all, which is pretty much free money given that you need to spend it anyway. So um, I may not encourage someone to jump into the AMX Platinum right now, uh, but if you have it, uh, these, these are pretty good ways of kind of offsetting the fees. So uh, Aaron, how, how are you thinking about the premium card equation now? I mean, if you look at all of these here, uh, I can't make any argument for getting into any of them at this very moment, uh, but what do you think existing card holders should be thinking about? Yeah, so um, um, yeah, like you correctly mentioned, Amex Platinum Charge Card has been uh, doing the most uh, and partly because it's also um, one of the highest annual card fees out there for the premium cards. Uh, yeah, so I mean $500 statement credit and double rewards, uh, it's definitely an extension, potential extension of your, your, your vouchers if they're expiring. I think that's a good reason to keep the card. Um, I think for the other cards, uh, for me personally, I will not hold any card that doesn't give you miles for your annual fee. Um, granted, uh, if you look at some of them, if, uh, you might be paying a hefty fee for your, for your miles that you're going to get from your annual fee. Um, but um, it might be a bit premature to, if you're already holding on to the card, I, I, I don't see why you should cut your card uh, uh, prematurely. Uh, you might want to wait it out to see if there's anything that they're going to roll out. 
I think City Prestige uh, just announced that you're allowed to roll your limousine, uh, limousine rights uh, to, to within the calendar year. I think that's a, a good thing that they're doing, but I don't think it's enough. Uh, for HSBC, I think um, the two uh, fast track immigration and two uh, airport transfers that are complementary every calendar year, I think uh, not a good enough reason to sign up for the card, but I think if you have the card, uh, I don't think you should cut it as yet. We're not, we're not sure what's going to happen in the months to come if they're going to roll out anything interesting. Yeah, so that's my take. Absolutely no waivers, you know, or not even like partial waivers. I mean, the City Prestige Telegram group is full of people complaining about this because people have been asking. No concessions at all. I mean, the most was that limo thing that you mentioned, but otherwise it's still like business as usual. Still pay 535 for 25,000 miles. You know, that's 2.14 cents per mile. That's already a marginal proposition during, during good times. But even now, I mean, I can't use the lounge pass. I can't use the fourth night free. The airport limo, yeah, now that I can roll over, I guess it's not so bad, but that, that's hardly going to make me plump down another, another $535. So uh, to answer the question, I don't really think City Prestige uh, is worth getting into right now. If you already have it, like, like Aaron said, no reason to cancel early, but if the annual fee is coming up, you might consider jumping out for a while. And if nothing else, you know, if, if, you, if you jump out for, for 12 months, you will be eligible for a new to bank bonus, right? So now is a good time to reset your status as uh, any. Uh, as far as point out, you'll be Lady Solitaire, which I've actually not mentioned here. Uh, Lady Solitaire is kind of interesting. Um, uh, it's, it's also a pretty high-end card. I think the annual fee is like 480 something dollars or something like that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a good card because you get to choose the two bonus categories, right? Which you earn four miles per dollar on, first 3,000 every, every month. So um, what I like about the ladies' card here is because it's got flexibility. So every quarter you can change it. Obviously, no one's spending much on travel right now, but everyone's doing online dining. So you could presumably declare dining as your category for this quarter. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, it, it retains the flexibility to become something else later this year. If, if, if travel does resume, you can change your bonus category into travel. And I think that's pretty valuable. Uh, Lady Solitaire, I believe, at least waives the first year's fee, so maybe that's not too bad, right, as, as, a, as a potential option. Um, still on card strategy, though, I, I think the other thing, uh, Aaron's, Aaron's mentioned the HSBC Visa Infinite. Um, you know, I didn't actually know until recently about the biggest parts of the HSBC Visa Infinite is it gives you up to like four or five supplementary cards for free, all with the lounge uh, pass. So I can imagine someone paying for that during a good time because you get four or five additional lounge keys that you can give to your family members. Uh, but at, at this point in time, it's, it's, it's super marginal, if not like completely a deal breaker that you can't even travel, right? That's not even talking about Voyage because Voyage had the recent devaluation. Uh, they've introduced $5 earning blocks. They're, they're doing that. Uh, they, they, they've cut the overseas earning rate marginally. They have increased the uh, local earning rate, but you know, it's still an overall devaluation in uh, my book. So let's quickly talk uh, about the future before we go on to taking some more questions from the floor. Um, I wanted to include this uh, more as a thought experiment because uh, neither me nor the panelists have any idea what's going to happen for sure, right? This was, this is my travel plans as they stand right now for the next 12 months. Um, I've got a trip to London in September. Uh, it's kind of interesting, this trip to London was uh, the byproduct of that Alaska mile flight glitch that happened when they added Singapore Airlines that allowed you to redeem a pretty crazy itinerary for only 35,000 uh, miles in first class. So it's, uh, I need to start in Shanghai, right? So I fly Shanghai to Singapore, Singapore to London, London to Singapore, uh, all in first class, uh, except for one business class leg, right? For 35,000 miles and $40 a flat, which is just insane. Uh, I have no idea whether this thing happened. I'm actually, I don't think the issue is so much with Shanghai. I think the issue is with London, actually. Uh, because, you know, I, I think September might be cutting a bit too close. Uh, I've got Dubai in November. That was meant to be the chance to try the Emirates uh, shower on board experience. Um, again, not too sure what's going to happen there because, as we know, Emirates has cut back on their premium cabin experience. I don't know whether that will even be available. Uh, they have also stopped flying quite a few of the ace ready, so that might be marginal as well. Uh, close to movies kind of like give and take. You can pretty much do it any time, although I, I would like to see if that's possible. 
Uh, I did buy uh, some vouchers during the most recent Banyan Tree hotel sale. Uh, some of you may remember we, we wrote about this on, on the site that Banyan Tree was selling uh, highly discounted stay vouchers uh, and I bought a few uh, for Vietnam. So I'm hoping to do that early 2021. Uh, the alternatives for me, if none of these pan out, is to look at Tokyo City Christchurch because um, based on what I'm seeing in the news, there are countries that we are most likely to reestablish things with soon, even for leisure travel potentially over the next 12 months. So that's kind of like my, my backup plan. I really do want to do something over the next 12 months, but not really up to what I want to do, right? It's, it's, uh, I think we're all kind of hoping for the best, but I don't think anyone should be too optimistic right now about travel plans uh, for the rest of 2020. Um, Aaron, talk, talk me through this. So what's, what's on your radar? All right, so for, uh, for myself, um, as you can see, I'm um, hoping that uh, travel will, uh, I'll be able to travel from the end of the year. So I, I'm, not, I'm not putting anything within the near horizon. So the earliest trip that I've got there is uh, sometime in November, uh, Bali. It's actually a postponed trip. I had to postpone the trip as a result of COVID-19. Uh, but looking at um, how Indonesia is handling the situation, I, I, I have my reservations on, for that trip. Uh, then, um, yeah, so, so essentially how I pick the, um, the destinations is really much uh, what are the fast or green lane arrangements that Singapore is going to uh, embark on with uh, other governments on a bilateral basis. So uh, the moment these uh, fast lane arrangements uh, get uh, 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 picked up and uh, verified with uh, through essential travel, it might spill over to leisure travel first. So um, that's uh, what I anticipate. So if things are working well between Singapore and, and various other countries, I think it might be worthwhile to explore those countries first as opposed to, as you can see, I've completely avoided the Americas, North and South America because of the situation. Uh, in fact, uh, the epicenter is on South America, so I don't think you should even consider travel there. Uh, North America is not doing too well uh, as well. It's, uh, uh, um, so thankfully, I, I, I visited the US twice last year, so there's no reason for me to go back again. Yeah, but uh, Shanghai is an obvious choice because uh, 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 Singapore and China has already established fast lane ar arrangements, and my backup would be um, so in, Aus in Australia because I think those will be the next countries on the cards for Singapore. To, uh, to embark on fast lane arrangements. So th that's the outlook for myself in the next 12 months. Yeah, uh, I also asked this to that stuff, but he told me nothing at all, really? Not, not even a, a hope and pray kind of trip? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's very difficult to make any kind of uh, planning now. So uh, until I get some clarity on whether I can uh, travel to that place safely and uh, you know, that, that, that I can maybe be spared from a lengthy quarantine when I get back. I, mm. I, I, I'm actually not intending to uh, travel anywhere. No, and look, I think that's completely reasonable. Obviously, if 14-day if quarantine is, is in the picture, like all these plans of mine are completely out of the picture. I'm not going to do 14 days when I go there, 14 days when I come back, right? All this assumes that won't be a consideration. Uh, I see some people asking you questions about travel propositions to Taiwan, Hong Kong, or China. Uh, I, I think it's possible for Taiwan at least. I mean, I, I did hear some, some hearsay about that, but again, I'm not really an, an official source. Uh, in China, I mean, we're already having, kind of interesting, right? For, for all the talk about having the travel bubble with Australia, et cetera, first country that, by, that we've actually had a green link agreement with is, 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 is China. So I, I, do, I do think China would probably be uh, safe bet, assuming that their numbers stay stay down. Uh, but otherwise, it's um, it's really up in the air right now. Um, I, I'm really crossing my fingers uh, that at least Australia will 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 will, will come through. Uh, I just saw someone remind me in the chat that yes, I actually did buy a Qatar Airways uh, ticket to uh, Australia. Uh, for those of you who are not primed on the idea, Qatar Airways is having this pretty amazing promotion where you can buy a ticket to a given destination and then change anywhere within 5,000 miles for the same price. You don't even pay the difference in, in, in taxes. Uh, so I, I bought a, a, a Vietnam to Cambodia flight, the Fifth Freedom flight, and I just changed it to uh, uh, Sydney. So it's kind of amazing, hoping, hoping that that does happen. Okay, so look, let's, let's spend uh, the time we have, let's go through some of these Q&As, right? Because I think some of these, uh, really worth answering. So, uh, question here, choice of city prestige card. 
fourth night free cashback or 10x points with Caligo? Uh, Aaron, what's, what's your thought process? Uh, I'm inclined to go for fourth night free um, because, um, I mean, uh, for OTAs, right? Uh, I, I mean, if you do your own homework for most of the properties that you tend to stay, uh, I think you would find that Caligo is um, marginally a bit more than other OTAs like Expedia and Agoda. So um, even if I were to go for, um, even if I were to ditch the fourth, uh, fourth night free uh, for miles, I would be inclined to use the preview mouse card on Expedia, for example, where I can get six miles per dollar. Uh, so yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick the, uh, but if you give me the, between those two choices, I will go for the fourth night because uh, I'll rather pick that over the Caligo. Yeah. Right. This isn't hypothetical, right? You, you are, at, are you a city prestige card holder right now? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah, but then the other thing that's bugging me is that they've, they've kind of been cracking down on the whole fourth night free, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not capped yet, but it's definitely not as good as it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, I yeah. Um, that's why I, I don't really use it that much. Uh, yeah, if I were to go for an OTA option, I would uh, pick the Privy Mouse card actually. Yeah. Okay, question. Is it a good time to apply for new credit cards in this climate? Promotions are weak at the moment and I won't hit the sign up spending bonus. That's there a good time to apply for cards or not? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it's a good time. I think you, um, so I think both Aaron Wong and, and, and myself, uh, we are, we are uh, affiliates of uh, SingSaver. And uh, SingSaver periodically releases uh, different kind of sign-on rewards. I think uh, most recently they have one campaign with Citibank and Stand Chart, which gives free uh, Apple AirPods yeah. when you sign on uh, a new card if you're new to the bank, right? So uh, even if you are an existing uh, like card holder holding another card, you do get things like a Grab reward, a uh, Grab food voucher. So there, there are always uh, cards, uh, and I think the, the general strategy, one that I use myself, is that if you find, uh, you, you will find that a few cards are similar, like for example, the uh, uh, Stanchart Unlimited card, the Amex True Cashback card, and the uh, CD Cashback Plus card, right? So what I do is I, I rotate among them, right? So that uh, every 12 months, I'm a new to the bank customer. So now I'm still clocking the, the time to be a new to the bank customer to, to stand chart. Yeah, so yeah, just do that strategy and, and stay tuned for the rewards. Uh. Yeah, so I think what, what that's the touchdown is quite important because uh, not all the promotions require you to spend money. Like the most recent one for the standard chartered, uh, if, if, if you're new to bank standard chartered card holder, right, as long as you're approved, right, you get the airports. There's absolutely no spending required as well. So I, I do take the point, I would not be signing up for cards with very big spending requirements. Like for example, the Amex Chris Lyre Ascent, I think it's at $10,000 in uh, three months. Uh, unofficially, I know Amex has extended the six months, but even that's kind of a, a, a stretch right now. But not all of the promotions right now require spending. So I would definitely keep my eyes open for that because there is still, amazingly, there are still banks which are offering pretty good value, either directly or through uh, platform to Saver. So it, it, it doesn't mean that the market for promotions is completely dead as of, as of right now, at least. Uh, question, should we be worried about the glut of miles with all these promotions? I assume airlines are selling them cheaper to the banks. I personally am not privy to that commercial arrangement of how much they're selling. Um, do I think that the glut of miles, I, I assume the question behind the question here is, are we going to see devaluation? I, I touched on this earlier on. I, I wouldn't be worried about Chris Lyre. Like I, 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 famous last words again, but I just can't see a scenario in which we're going to have a devaluation over the next two years. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, number one, because there's no capacity pressure on flights right now. It's completely the opposite. I mean, the Singapore Airlines cabin crew, uh, I, I've heard, heard from a friend, uh, have heard that Singapore Airlines will not use the A380 for the next 12 months. Uh, simply because there is no demand for it. There's, they simply can't fill up an A380. And if you can't fill up an A380, right, even on your so-called high capacity routes like Singapore to, to London, uh, how is there pressure on, on, uh, on, on seats? Right? Your devaluations happen when too many miles chase too few seats. And I don't see the too few seats being an issue uh, for the near future. Uh, but Aaron, let's, 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 let's hear from you. I mean, what's, what's your thoughts on potential of devaluations? Um, yeah, because uh, we've already seen um, a recent devaluation on Chris Flyer, a couple of devaluations in the past few years. So 
uh, I think uh, airlines, uh, SQ included, uh, would probably want to get passengers back in the seats. I think it doesn't make business sense to, uh, to have a hard devaluation, uh, as I would like to call it, because uh, that would just deter passengers from, uh, from traveling. Uh, I, mean, um, I mean, it just goes against uh, common sense. Yeah, so uh, hopefully, hopefully we don't see any devaluations in the pipeline. <laughs> we hope, we pray. Uh, Ivan saw this question, government's announced green link for China, COVID-19 test, does it make leisure travel worth it? Yeah, look, so Ivan, obviously in the, new ter in, 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 in the near term, I think leisure travel is, is let, let's just be realistic, right? It's, it's not going to happen for next two, three, possibly even four months. Uh, even when it does resume, you're probably going to have to do some sort of testing. Uh, whether or not that testing is free or whether it's paid for, again, depends on the government's approach. Uh, we have seen two models uh, in Austria, in Vienna. People can pay uh, 190 euros, some, some hefty figure like that, to do a COVID-19 test upon arrival, right? And if it's negative, they, they don't need to do the quarantine. Uh, but we've seen other countries like Iceland. Uh, Iceland is hoping to open up for tourism uh, this, this summer. And I believe for two weeks, at least that was what the plan was, for two weeks, they will give uh, uh, free, free testing. So we really need to see uh, what the testing regime is. And I, I, I do believe that um, contingent on uh, what, that leisure travel does depend on the ability to develop accurate, low cost, rapid testing kits. I think that's kind of the answer. If it's possible to do a five minute test at minimal cost before flying, it is an inconvenience, but it does make it a lot more feasible than what we have right now. Emirates, famous example, right? Emirates made a big hoo-ha, big PR thing about doing pre-flight testing uh, and they stopped it very quietly after a few weeks because those test kits were like 30, 40% accurate. So I don't think scientifically we are at that level yet where we're able to do mass testing, low cost and reliable. So not, not really here. Uh, question from Nicholas, will your valuation of a mile be higher if you're willing to redeem non-direct flights that gives you the opportunity to fly more sectors in premium cabins? Uh, Aaron, Will your valuation be higher if you can do those like really convoluted routings that let you spend like 18 hours in the plane? Do you even want to spend 18 hours in the plane right now? Um, I mean, I mean, in a perfect world, yes. I mean, uh, it would be ideal if you can spend more hours in a premium cabin, but it just doesn't make sense now, even in the, 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 the year to come or even two years from now. Uh, I would think uh, it's better to keep your itineraries uh, simple. Think point to point. Uh, and don't route through cities because you can, uh, if your itinerary may seem perfect now, but it may be, um, it might go into shambles the next day when one country in your itinerary decides to lock down again because of a surge in COVID-19 cases. And when that happens, uh, you're just going to uh, have to go through a lot of replanning and, 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 and claiming back miles that you have uh, vested in your flights, so on and so forth. So I think it's best to keep it simple for now, at least in the next year. Uh, think point to point. Actually, this is, this is a fantastic point, right? I've not, I've not thought about that, but yeah. Um, positioning flights right now, very risky. I know some of us have bought that Qatar Airways fare uh, where you need to position to Vietnam first. Uh, hoping nothing happens, but uh, look, just think of it like points of failure, right? At, at a time like this, if, if, if your itinerary is A to B, well, mathematically speaking, fewer things can go wrong if it's A to B to C. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I do think that the days of people flying like Mountie Lake, Seven Lakes uh, trips might not be feasible at the moment, uh, simply because all it takes is one country to interpose a, a testing requirement, quarantine requirement, and it kind of ruins everything. Okay, let's just take a couple uh, more questions. Uh, so Roger's asking a good question here. Uh, should I do refund or take bonus flight credit? So I don't know, uh, Aaron, that's the, I, either one of you. Uh, have you got any outstanding tickets? Are you going to take the refund or are you going to take the bonus vouchers, bonus credits? So uh, in my case, um, I, was del I actually deliberated uh, for, for, uh, on that question. Uh, and what happened was SQ actually cancelled the flight anyway. So, so I, I didn't have to do anything. And, and then I had the option to basically reschedule it or to um, uh, leave it open dated, uh, especially if, if it was before 9th of April. Uh, that's when the T's and C's changed for for rescheduling a flight. So, so I think uh, if you can sit on it, uh, it's okay. I mean, especially if it's on SQ, because you can be sure that your mouse won't just disappear and that there are several options available to you should you need to postpone your trip. Yeah. Uh, so for... Sorry, sorry, that's all right. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is a very interesting question because uh, both of my co-founders experienced it. 
one experience a refund and one uh, experience a cancellation and, a, and an open ticket, right? So um, uh, I think this really depends on whether you intend to travel to that location, right? Uh, the, for, in the refund case, the, the frustration that one of my co-founders face is that um, the, the whole refund process takes really long, right? It's very troublesome. They don't, uh, until now, uh, for a trip that was scheduled in, I think, April, uh, the co-founder has not received back his mouse credit, right? So you don't want to have that frustration of uh, chasing the, the airline and seeing whether it's credited and then just following up because the, the I guess the onus is on you. you. It is your mouse. You want to get it back. And then this, uh, I think it's a lot of frustration and probably unnecessary if you intend to go to that location uh, in the first place, right? Uh, if it's a matter of, you know, I can't go this year, I'll go next year, then... Uh, Personally, I would I would pick the, the open ticket. Yeah. So uh, so so to add my, my two cents to this uh, to Roger's question, uh, Roger, if my see how how the bonus type credits work is that it's a fixed value regardless of how much you pay for your ticket. So for economy class, it's always seventy five dollars. Now, if I bought a two hundred dollar Bali ticket, right, I will be much more inclined to take the flight credits because obviously seventy five out of two hundred is a bigger percentage. But if I bought like a thousand two hundred dollar return ticket to say San Francisco, I probably wouldn't take the seventy five, right? So it, it has to be about perspective. If your base fare is very low, the flight credits are obviously a lot more attractive because as a percentage it is higher. Uh, that the more you pay, I, I really would rather have that 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 money back. Uh, and the other thing you need to think about, right, is even your 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 flight credits. They may not be sufficient to cover fare differences depending on what you think is going to happen to airfares after COVID-19. Uh, I don't think you need to be worried too much. I just don't see any scenario in which they suddenly skyrocket because I don't think social distancing is going to take place on planes, at least not in terms of seating. IATA has come up very strongly against that. They've, they've run the numbers. Majority of airlines would not break even if you have the social distancing. They cannot break even at low factors of about 65, 66 percent. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about, about airfares suddenly skyrocketing. Uh, but that's it. Uh, if you're changing your destination, like if, for example, you, you put say, Singapore to Bali, but now you want to fly Singapore to, say, Manila, uh, obviously that, that fair difference will come into the picture and that could be uh, a bit higher than, than what it would be if you just stuck to uh, Bali. So yeah, uh, the only other thing I would add about your, your, your refund scenario is uh, do, do keep in mind, if you have used that card to hit a sign-up bonus, uh, there could be a potential complication because getting a refund is like you didn't spend that. And, and technically speaking, the bank does have the right to claw back the miles. So just be very careful about that, especially those of you who did the SCB at part sign up bonus uh, last year. The last thing you want to do is to get back a few hundred dollars and lose uh, a whole stack of miles. Yeah, so that, that is still, still, still possible. Okay, I'm sorry. I know we still have additional questions here, but unfortunately, we are out of time for this session. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to join me tonight. Uh, and if you still have questions, uh, do feel free to join our Telegram or Facebook communities. Um, I will, uh, they, they, they are linked in, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Maulion webpage, right? Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Please do stay safe. Uh, we're going to try and run a few more of these sessions uh, before, uh, before my, my Zoom subscription runs out. So do, do stay tuned for that. Uh, once again, thank you guys. Uh, everyone have a good evening uh, and, and stay safe. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Uh, let's do a Aaron. So uh, don't log off yet. Let me just get uh, the first slide up and do a nice one here. It's too bad I can't see everyone else uh, here, but you know, we can't have everyone's webcam on. Okay, look at the camera. One, two, three, smile. There we go. Uh, it's good enough. All right, everyone take care. Uh, be safe and good night. Yeah, thanks. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.